Jumbo, my beautiful people, and welcome to Espresso Talk Today, the podcast where we think and talk Black liberation, Black empowerment, Black history, and all things Black. I'm your host, Amma Robin, and today we are diving into the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as we're preparing to celebrate the MLK holiday. We're going to remember today the real Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. today. What was his real message? What was he really fighting for? Who really opposed making his birthday into a holiday? How can we really celebrate this hard-won holiday? Is Dr. King's message really relevant today? We are going to answer all of these questions and more in this uncommon show today. But before we dive in, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you're feeling the show, share it with your fam, your crew, your circle, everyone in your community. We'd really appreciate it. And I know they would too. Now grab that espresso and close the door behind you. We're going to get deep and we're going to get real. Y'all might not be ready for this. Akwaba, welcome, my beloved brothers, sisters, and gender-neutral individuals to the Espresso Talk Today podcast show. So yes, we are going to talk about the real Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his real legacy today. Honestly, I'm never more than three thoughts away from Dr. King. I read his books and other writings. I've read about him. I see movies about him. I've read essays. You know, I I just think about a lot of his quotes and his speeches and his sermons. Yes, perhaps I'm a King groupie, but it's worth it. And if you study Dr. King in the way that I have, you might feel the same way too. Maybe not, maybe not. (laughs) You know, everyone's different. He was not a perfect person, but he was much more than white Western history is giving him credit for being. He is more than a man who had a dream. And there's nothing wrong with dreaming. But he wasn't just sitting around gazing at the stars. He was on the front lines of a righteous and courageous movement and a philosophy that threatened the very white patriarchal, supremacist, corporatist, militarist power structure. His philosophy and work damaged it, but it didn't destroy it. And unfortunately, that structure still exists today. We have so much to talk about. But let's begin with discussing how this radical preacher activist's birthday became a national holiday. You see, and this is for you youngins, MLK Day wasn't always a federal holiday. In fact, many people opposed it, including all the way up to the highest levels of government, President Ronald Reagan. I have to look up to see if Biden did. I'll get back to you on that one. So let's unpack the history and learn why this day was so controversial and so significant. Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday was established to honor the life and work of this iconic civil rights leader and visionary. And it wasn't an easy journey to make it into a federal holiday. The idea of celebrating King's birthday as a national holiday was first introduced four days, just four days after his assassination on April 4th, 1968. However, it took 15 long years of advocacy and lobbying and pressure you know, for for this to happen. Representative John Conyers, a Democrat from Michigan, introduced the bill for the holiday, but it was also strongly supported by people like Coretta Scott King. I mean, more than just supported. She was actually one of the leaders of this. And activists like Stevie Wonder. In fact, he wrote the song, Happy Birthday. I know y'all know that song in honor of Martin Luther King's birthday. President Reagan, 
President Ronald Reagan signed the bill to make Dr. King's birthday into a holiday on November 2nd, 1983. And I can tell you, he must have been in tears. He must have been cringing. It must have been so hard for him. And I'm really, really glad because I watched it happen. And I could see that he was trying to put on the charm, but he was fuming inside. Well, it's strange because so many people loved Martin Luther King, right? No, not exactly. And no, <laughs> they, they didn't love him. And he had lots of enemies and not everyone agreed with the idea of an MLK holiday. And many opposed it for various reasons. President Reagan, for instance, was strongly opposed to it, arguing that it would be too costly and that there would be, that we already had enough holidays. We already have Washington's birthday and, you know, it, that, that was enough. Okay, I'm gonna ask you, can you spell BS? Well, I can, and I can tell you that that was BS. President Reagan, being the racist that he was, to the very end, never wanted to see the celebration of a black man's birthday as a national holiday. He also didn't support anything that Dr. King stood for. For example, desegregation, civil rights, or even voting rights for black people. Yes, Reagan was a segregationist. And he was a conservative, corporate capitalist who opposed King's views on economic equal equality. We're going to have more on that later, okay? We're going to come back to that, don't worry. Reagan believed in militarism, and he, he used his power as commander-in-chief of the armed forces to invade many countries. Remember Grenada? Little tiny in the Caribbean island Grenada? Yes, Reagan invaded that country. He condoned political assassinations and committed regime change activities around the world. Of course, mostly focused on countries of, of color. Dr. King was opposed to all forms of militarism and would have been opposed to nearly every policy and activity that Ronald Reagan used to support white supremacy, e economic inequality, and attacks on, peop on people of color. And that was why. You know, he opposed the U.S. war against Vietnam. Of course, Dr. King did not live to see Ronald Reagan become president. Oh, thank goodness. But he did not, not that he, he I wanted him to be, you know, not alive, but it would have been hard for him to work with someone like Reagan, although he would have. But he did see others, and he fought against other white supremacists who were very similar to Reagan. You know, just pull out your history books and you'll find, you know, Bull Connor, Strom Thurmond, and Jesse Helms, and others who basically, you know, were racist Reagan clones. And you don't have to go too far back in history for to find them, by the way. Despite Reagan's opposition, Martin Luther King's birthday was first celebrated as a holiday in 1986. And it passed the, the Congress with such a wide margin that it basically became veto-proof because there was talk that Reagan was going to try to veto it if it came through. But then there would have been enough votes to override the veto, and that would have been terribly embarrassing to Reagan. I would have loved to have seen that, actually. But it's good that it showed that the Congress was so much in support of it that it was a veto-proof bill and Reagan was forced to you know, clench his teeth and sign it. And the opposition we faced in making that holiday into a reality just has to keep reminding us that the struggle for equality is still going on and still requires persistence. You know, even after everything that happened with George Floyd, you know, they still were not able to pass a police reform bill. The George Floyd police reform bill still did not pass. You see, so the struggle is still real. A holiday is one thing that's very important, but police reform and other kinds of reforms are, are important too. And black people are still having trouble getting real representation and power in Congress. We are going to take a short breather break here. This gives both of us a chance to breathe for a minute. You know, when things get intensive, you know I like to take do some deep breathing exercises. And yes, I am getting really intense and I'm getting worked up. And no, I'm not going to apologize for that at all. 
but breathing helps me. I hope it helps you too. I will see y'all in a minute. And you guys know how much I love this song. Gonna get a lot of dough. Anything is possible. Turn me up in the headphone. Yeah. Grind it, get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Yeah. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Stack that bread and buy my nose. Anything is possible. Yeah. Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with it, and let's get to it. Now, let's talk about the Martin Luther King Jr. that is not always portrayed in the mainstream media. Let's talk about the Martin Luther King Jr., the radical, the courageous, and the unapologetic King. As I said, Dr. King was more than a dreamer. Of course, he was a dreamer, but you know, you have to be in his kind of position. But he was a visionary and a disruptor. He challenged the status quo and demanded justice in a way that shook the foundations of the country and the world. I guess the world is also, you know, full of white supremacy too. You've got to shake all of that up and tear it down. People, white Westerners, like to think of Dr. King as focused only on domestic issues like civil rights. And of course, civil rights was a very important issue in the United States at the time, and it still is. But Dr. King was also living in a world that was dominated by Western colonialism, European colonialism throughout Africa, the exploitation of African resources and white supremacist hierarchies around the world. He was very much aware of and opposed to those racist and exploitative systems. Why don't we delve into another radical dimension of Dr. King's activism, his fierce fierce opposition to militarism. No, you're not gonna hear that on CNN. They're gonna talk about him and show him, show the I have a dream speech, that's true, and that's a great speech. But they're not gonna talk about his many, many, many speeches against war and against militarism. Dr. King believed that the excessive focus on military power and military might pose a grave threat to the principles of social justice and economic progress. Oh, that is so true. Oh my gosh, we don't focus on that, but it really, really is. And in his groundbreaking speech, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence, that's the title of it, you can find it on my website, he boldly declared, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense that on programs with social upl- of social uplift is approaching a spiritual death. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation, for those it calls enemy, for no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers. Oh boy, gosh, that is powerful. It really is. All right. Okay, I'm going to come back. Remember what I said. I'm kind of a groupie. I guess it's not difficult to see why Reagan and many white wealthy people despised Martin Luther King. Militarism was Reagan's way of bullying the world and taking control of the Western Hemisphere, as he said, to keep out the communists. Again, let's spell BS. Of course, instead, Reagan chose to support people, support groups and militias who raped, tortured, and killed poor people, peasant farmers, and most other people of color who were not wealthy supporters of white supremacy. In these powerful words, Dr. King challenged the prevailing racist and exploitive narrative of his time, and it's still of this time too. He pointed out that pouring vast resources into the military industrial complex not only perpetuated poverty, but also pushed our society closer to spiritual decay. He believed that we must prioritize social uplift over militarization, speaking for the vulnerable and advocating for peace with justice on a global scale. Now, 
<sighs> we just don't see that happening today. They don't even question. Congress doesn't even question the trillions going into the defense budget. You know, while education and health care and, you know, uh, child care, uh, care for seniors and the elderly and the poor are just, uh, you know, that's just not even on the table. But yet we can triple the military budget and our elective representatives are not, the majority of them, vast majority of them on both sides of the aisle are not questioning it. And that is absolutely wrong. And it is leading to moral decay of our country. It's also leading to, and I'm, lo- I'm looking around and seeing an economic financial decay and people are living in poverty. And Dr. King saw this coming and saw this happening. And it's absolutely, ha- it's even worse now. You know, this stance against militarism, his position against militarism was just one facet, one of the radical parts of Dr. King's broader vision for a more just and an equitable world. It's a reminder that his radical courage knew no boundaries and his fight for justice extended to all aspects of society, all people. He was not controlled or limited by the white supremacist powers who tried to make him stay only in the black domestic you know, black domestic lane or those issues. He was bigger than that. He knew it. They knew it too. Dr. King was not going to stay in his lane. And this made him dangerous. And it made them dangerous. It also endangered his work, his life, and his message. Okay, now again, I have to say, y'all might not be ready for this. Maybe you are, maybe not. But did you know that Dr. Martin Luther King was also very critical of capitalism? And his, he had an unwavering belief that the fight for civil rights was inseparable, indivisible from the battle against social, social and economic injustice. Dr. King saw economic inequality as a pressing issue, as a priority that demanded our attention, and it still does. He was opposed to classism in all its forms, and economic inequality was at the top of his agenda. Yes, this did make him dangerous to wealthy corporate classes who wanted to build a perpetual underclass, a peasant class, if you will, to serve multinational corporations and the wealthy and to allow them to destroy and rape the environment. Hmm, let's look around you. But let's hear Dr. King's words himself. Here we are in his quote, we must honestly face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you ask that question, you're raising questions about the economic system and about the broader distribution of wealth, end quote. And we know there are a lot more and a lot poorer people today. And we do have to then question about the economic system that is praising, you know, the people, the one percentage at the top and putting them on the news and giving them everything and allowing the lower 99%, let's just call it that because the middle class is basically a, a fiction, allowing us to be one paycheck away from living on the streets. You know, Dr. King's criticism of capitalism was not an attack on the concept of a a free enterprise itself, but rather a call for a more just and equitable and equitable economic system. He believed that the enormous wealth disparities in America were a grave injustice and that perpetuated poverty and inequality for people of all races and ethnicities. You know, and the more I look at capitalism, the more I'm seeing that it wasn't designed to allow everyone or the vast majority of people to live at at least a moderately decent level. That's not what it was designed to do. And so my feeling is that it has to go. But 
<laughs> that's just me, but one of Dr. King's most significant efforts to address this issue was the Poor People's Campaign. Do you remember that? The Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King's Dr. King envisioned a multiracial movement of impoverished people coming together to demand economic reforms. He aimed to shift the nation's priorities, redirect resources from the war and from militarism towards addressing poverty and improving the lives lives of all people. Dr. King's bold critique of capitalism challenges us to think critically about the economic structures that shape our society today. And this reminds us that the fight for civil rights is not limited to racial equality, but has to expand into economic justice and environmental justice. I mean, it it goes way beyond race, but race, I think, is at the core of it. His vision continues to inspire those who seek, like us, a more equitable and inclusive world. But my addition to this is that white supremacy is very much at the root of economic inequality and capitalism. And honestly, I'm thinking, as I said, that capitalism is just too rooted in white supremacy. It's got to go. But, but, save that for another show. Another focus of Dr. King, and this has been deeply buried, was his opposition yeah, to war and militarism. And we know that these two, two these are the two tools that the United States and other Western countries have used to dominate, bully, and terrorize countries of color. But wait, and you know, it just even happened today. I was just watching uh, Al Jazeera today and I just saw the US doing it again. You know, okay, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's take another break here. Let's breathe. You know, think, stretch, do push-ups, whatever makes you feel better. This is some deep stuff, and it's not easy to deal with. But I'll see you in a minute, and I'm just going to sit back and enjoy this song. Okay, actually, I'm going to get up and do some stretches and enjoy this song. See you in a minute. Girl, to get a lot of dough. Anything is possible. Turn me up in the headphone. Yeah. Trying to get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Yeah. Look at my glass. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Stack that bread and buy my nose. Anything is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Oh, we back. I hope you are uh, feeling ready to, to tackle this next part. Okay, here we go. Yes, Dr. King was a staunch, staunch, strong, unapologetic, unequivocal opponent of militarism. He believed that excessive military spending and the militarization of society, oh, do you see that happening today, pose a significant threat to social justice and economic progress. You know, and here are some of the key points, you know, about this. You know, he saw a direct link between the massive expenditures of the military industrial complex and the persistence of poverty in America. Boy, he was such a visionary. He saw that the vast resources poured into the military could better be used to alleviate poverty and invest in social programs. You know, as we said here, at one of his most radical speeches, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence, delivered on April 4th, 1967, exactly one year before his assassination, that he publicly denounced the Vietnam War. He passionately stated that the U.S. government was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And guess what? Those exact words are still true. I mean, the American government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And it has some close allies like Israel and called for an end to the war. This speech marked a pivotal moment in his activism, you know, from civil rights to war and peace, and that goes global. Dr. King highlighted how militarism and the arms race were diverting resources away from social programs like education and health care, and that marginalized communities were affected most, and that's our community. He argued that the priorities of the government were misplaced with war efforts 
and taking precedence over the welfare of its citizens. Well, his opposition was not limited to domestic concerns, and he did, yeah, he did believe that there should be peace and justice globally rather than military intervention. You know, he fought for civil rights. Dr. King supported the path of nonviolence. But Dr. King was more than a man with a dream. I keep saying that he was a man with a vision. He opposed war and militarism. He fought economic inequality. He fought poverty and rampant capitalism. And yes, Dr. King fought white supremacy everywhere he found it. And yet we had to fight for a holiday celebrating this man. And it took more than 15 years to establish it. It was opposed at the highest level of government where white supremacy was and remains deeply entrenched. But, you know, white supremacists lost that battle but they won the war. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? That sounds kind of strange. Lost the battle, but won the war. They lost the battle over the King holiday, but they won the war over King's legacy. They have stripped King's message down to, I have a dream, rather than his powerful message and statements against white supremacy, and economic inequality, and corporate exploitation, war, militarism, and I don't know if y'all were ready to hear that. And many people don't want to know and don't know about the courageous, radical king. You know, I, I don't know why, but sometimes people would just rather keep this soft vision of him, but not the radical him, the radical real king. But it is a fact. So since we won, the, won that battle for the MLK holiday, let's talk about you know, let's use it. Let's let's milk this because it is important. Let's talk about how we can celebrate it and how we can remember his legacy and continue his courageous and radical fight. And I want to start by reminding you that the battle for King for King Day, Martin Luther King Day, was led by the courageous and radical Coretta Scott King. Let's take one last breather break here, and then we will wind it down. And I got some information I think y'all are going to want to know. <laughs> and I hope that y'all are ready for this. See you in a minute. Okay, so we're back, and I think we're going to start winding it down now. But, but, let's talk about, you know, the Martin Luther King holiday, because we fought so hard for it, and it is important. I don't care what white supremacists say, and we're going to, to celebrate it. But you know what? As we reflect on Martin Luther King Jr. Day and its significance, it is essential. It's absolutely, utterly, you know, hugely important to me to acknowledge the remarkable contributions of Coretta Scott King, you know, the wife, Dr. Martin Luther King. She was not just a supportive spouse, but a formidable force and an accomplished woman in her own right. And she was instrumental in carrying forward Dr. King's legacy and making MLK Day a reality. Coretta Scott King understood that this day should not be merely a day off from work or school, but a day of meaningful service and action. Listen to her words Well, I'm going to read them. In quotes, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is not just a day off, it's a day on. It's not a day to simply relax or enjoy leisure time, but a day to honor the legacy of a man who dedicated his life to fighting for justice, equality, and peace. It's a day to roll up our sleeves, get involved, and make a difference in our communities. Coretta Scott King envisioned Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a day of reflection, education, and service. And this is where individuals from all backgrounds can come together to work towards a just and equitable society It's a day to carry on Dr. King's mission by taking action against injustice and inequality. So with that in mind, how can 
we celebrate Martin Luther King Day authentic, authentically and meaningfully. I have a few suggestions. I know that you probably have some great ideas on your own and I would love to hear about them. But let me just throw out a few of my own. And there are actually some more on the Espresso Talk Today Power blog. Volunteer. You know, volunteer at a local shelter. Spend the day at a local shelter, a food bank, or a soup kitchen to directly assist those in need within your community. You know, senior citizen outreach. Yes, the elders still need us just as much as we need them. Visit a local senior center or a nursing home, you know, virtually if possible, if, if necessary, to spend time with and provide companionship to the elderly residents. Community garden work. Wow, you know how much I love nature, but a, a, a community garden is such an amazing idea. Let's see, join the garden work on urban farming project to help cultivate fresh produce for underserved neighborhoods. You know, that's really important. We've talked about that a lot in a special talk today. Here's, here's one you might not think of. Donate blood. Yes, our communities need you know, need blood and we don't need it shipped in from far away when, when it's an emergency situation. We need it within the local community at local centers, healthcare centers. So please donate blood in certain, uh, you know, certain blood types are needed more than others, but whatever, just go donate blood to people for people in our communities. Here's one, you know, I'm going to love this one, a radical reading dive into radical literature, articles, or speeches by Dr. Martin Luther King and other influential activists. Take note and share your insights with your friends on social media. Get the dialogue going. For people who like to write, what about a letter writing campaign? Write letters to elected officials advocating for policy changes related to social justice, affordable housing, criminal justice reform, environment, the environment, climate change, or anything else. Ah, here's one I love too. Boycott and divestment campaigns. Wow, you know, those are the thing now, and they are so powerful. Launch a boycott or divestment campaign against businesses or institutions that perpetuate racism. So let's see another one, protest and rally. You know, protest is so important and you know that's right up Dr. King's you know, alley. So these are just a few suggestions. Some things that you can do today, some that you can do every day, others may take longer to implement, but just do something. Be of service. Remember, Dr. King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, What are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? And remember, Dr. King totally believed in, supported, and encouraged youth activism. Let's think of John Lewis. He was a teenager when he started working for civil rights. And black children, school children, regularly marched with Dr. King for civil rights. And yeah, they were attacked by police. That's shameful on their part. But the school children kept marching. Youth activism was essential to the success of the civil rights movement. And youth activism is still important to fight modern day colonialism, economic and and, and social inequality, and to fight against the white patriarchal supremacist system. For this Dr. Martin Luther King Day, let's ask ourselves, What are we doing for others? So remember, fellow warriors, my fellow warriors, know this deep in your soul that you are powerful and together we are invincible. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing for each other? So this winds us down here. But you know what? You can visit us at the Espresso Talk Today website at EspressoTalkToday.com. You can listen to our Black Empowerment podcast there. You can also find the Power Blog and lots of helpful resources on mental health, financial empowerment, women's health, anti-racism materials, and a whole lot more. 
If you want to keep discussing or just reading about these issues, then I really invite you to subscribe to my weekly Black Empowerment newsletter, The No More Beat. No More Beat. We discuss lots of different issues there. You know, get your dose of Black Empowerment and Black Liberation every single week. Never a dull moment, but lots of powerful, uplifting, and liberating moments. You can subscribe on the Special Talk Today website, especialtalktoday.com, or on our Instagram at Ama Robin L. That's Ama, A M A underscore R O B I N underscore the letter L. And please join us on Instagram to discuss these issues, share your thoughts, and find an uplifting and a safe space where you are valued and heard. Again, on Instagram at Ama Robin L. I'm Ama Robin for Espresso Talk today. And let me just take a moment to wish Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a happy 95th heavenly birthday. 95th heavenly birthday. You will never be forgotten, sir. And thank you so, so, so much for your service. I'm Ama Robin. And remember, now more than ever, strength, soul, and reparations. Ashe community.